Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, impressed you got up early. I'm impressed I got up early. Um, huge pleasure to be here. Um, what I'm going to do, hopefully uh, befitting the introduction, I'm going to try and sort of challenge a few perceptions. It, it will be depressing and yet at the same time hopefully uplifting because I think uh, you always have to finish on a high. So I'll try and finish on a high because as you see, that's the title. I think there is hope, but I think we've got to be a lot smarter than we currently are. Okay, so, um, so basically you'll see there's a wheel in both um, cities. So I've come from London to lovely Singapore and uh, thank you very much, uh, A, for the invitation and B, for the uh, lovely hospitality since I've been here. And this is where I work. So behind is the tower block of the hospital and that beautiful red brick Victorian Gothic building used to be the hospital, but now it houses uh, my lab. So I'll show you some of the lab research I've been doing on this topic. OK, so uh, there's a lot of propaganda in intensive care. Aren't we doing well? So you'll see this is one example of looking at registry data. You can see that, OK, sepsis is going up in incidence, but look how good the mortality is. Look how well we're doing. Mortality going down from 40% to 27%. And the authors conclude an increasing number of admissions for sepsis combined with declining mortality rates contribute to more individuals surviving to hospital discharge. However, let's have a look at the figures, because if you look at the denominator, in a mere seven years, it's gone up from 300,000. Now it's you know, an epidemic, 781,000. And the mortality actually doubled. So twice as many people are dying rather than more individuals surviving. So again, it's all about you know, proportions and coding. Maybe there was under-reporting at the beginning, over-reporting later on, because there's a, a financial incentive to call someone in the United States sepsis rather than pneumonia. But you'll see these figures. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign puts out these figures, but it doesn't take into account Pneumonia, oh, pneumonia, um, coding. I'm going to be a little bit rude about my Australian colleagues. I love uh, Ronaldo to bits. But again, this came out of the ANZICS database. Your manager is familiar with it. Aren't the Australians doing well? Look at these remarkably good mortality rates. But again, look at the denominator. All right, more hospitals are being involved, but now you're looking at many more patients. Are they being diluted by patients who are now more beds are available, perhaps they're less sick? Hmm. This came out from the UK database, which basically tried to replicate, see how the UK database fared against the ANZICS database. And you'll see here that there's a similar trend the Australians do better. They've got more beds. We're a poor country. We're still developing in the UK. But if you look on the right-hand side, they had the risk category, which is a sort of severity grading. But one is the least, four is the sickest. But you can see the green has been going down, whereas the less sick patients are going up and up and up. And they're the patients who, obviously, their survival rates are better. So there has been some improvement, but nowhere near as good as this graph would have you suggest. So I'm going to contend that most of the benefit we've seen, reflected in these sorts of statistics, relates perhaps to less iatrogenic harm. We're better at ventilating, drowning patients is hopefully much less than it used to be. We don't abuse them. We're over-sedating them, etc. I think the quality of surgery, in particular, anesthesia has improved. So I think there are lots of reasons why we're helping the patient rather than harming the patient. I would argue that much less impact has been achieved with altering the natural course of the disease. 
We haven't yet got the wonder drug for sepsis, the magic bullet. We've been looking for it for 20, 30 years. We're still looking. Will one exist? And I'm going to contend that patients actually come into hospital, by and large, to live or die. Oh, dear. So in other words, patients either should live, provided we don't screw up, or die, but we just prolong their death. Can we improve on this statistic? OK, let me try and justify that bold statement. Patients come into hospital to live or die. A few studies. This is a, a nice American study based from uh, John Kellum and colleagues. This was a Genim study. The idea was to look at some sort of genetic identifier of patients who come in and do badly. They couldn't find any, but they took blood. This is in the emergency department in nearly 2,000 patients with community-acquired pneumonia. And what they found was that patients who, in the emergency department, had high levels of interleukin-6, a pro-inflammatory cytokine, interleukin-10, and anti-inflammatory cytokine, ended up at 90 days with about a 40 45% mortality. On the other hand, if you had low levels of both, you had a very low risk of dying, and the combination somewhere in between. And that was actually better, more accurate, than sort of looking at the patient. Clearly, the very sick ones did badly, but there were lots of gray ones. But you could see there was this quite marked separation, even in the emergency department. This is uh, from Holland. Again, patients with presumed infection sepsis who required admission. The emergency department troponin T, the high sensitivity troponin T level, again, significantly higher in those patients who'd go on to die. Area under the curve, about 0.8. It's so pretty good. This is another US study where looking at metabolomes and proteomes and again, blood taken in the emergency department, they did the analysis, and you could identify the patients who would go on to die. They repeated the bloods 24 hours later, and there was even greater separation in the metabolomic profile. As you can see there, it differed markedly from those who would survive. Obviously, it's metabolomic, so I won't go into the detail, but they found it diverged more as death approached, the 24-hour sample. And yes, it got more severe, more extreme in those that went on to die, whereas the survivors, the profile was similar regardless of clinical severity. So all of these different markers are showing you can identify the patient very, very early, before really the doctor has actually done anything to the patient in terms of active management. And it's the same with a whole load of biomarkers. These are all sort of day one of intensive care admission. But you've got here, you can prognosticate in terms of cortisol levels and response to ACTH, catecholamines, cytokines, lipid profiles, inflammation, coagulation, fibrinolysis predict mortality, estradiol predicts mortality, low levels of cholesterol prognostic, thyroid and mortality, troponin, BNP, I'll come back to that later on, autonomic dysfunction predicts mortality, dysregulated microRNAs, Plasma DNA, nucleated red blood cells, mortality risk goes up, L-selectin levels, metabolic derangements. I love my mitochondria, mitochondrial dysfunction. And my favorite one from Japan, fecal pH. As you can see, they're not obviously related, all of these different targets. That's another lecture, but they probably are. But you can see how many different things early on in the patient's stay can distinguish patients who'll do badly and patients who'll do well. So the corollary, as I mentioned before, patients are by and large predestined to come in and either live or die. You can pick up this fact as early as their point of arrival in hospital. 
So we're very good at supporting those predicted to live, but perhaps, as I mentioned earlier, we're just prolonging death in those who are predicted to die. Because the die has been cast, we've already said at the time of admission, you're going to die, probably. Perhaps this explains the failure of many of these ICU survival studies. So if somebody's predicted to live, all right, you might improve quality of life issues, get them out of hospital quicker. But if you're doing a survival study, you're not going to make them survive binary equation, yes, no, any differently. So we should be targeting the ones who are going to die to see if we can improve outcomes, whereas the ones who are going to survive, A, we need to see are we causing harm, and B, we need to see what's their quality of life issues. So you see where I'm coming from? You know, I, I would argue that the way we're approaching, especially mortality studies in intensive care, is doomed to failure because we're looking at it the wrong way. We need, I think, to be far more sophisticated. OK, so we can predict death. Sorry, Mrs. Smith. You know, your, your numbers say you're not going to do well. Do we then not admit them to intensive care? Try because, you know, we'll get it wrong 5%, 10% of the time. Or can we do anything about it? Can we beat nature? Hmm. Steroids. Who here are steroid fans? There's a few hands. And me. I think steroids are great in the right patient. Can we pick the right patient? I was involved, oops, sorry, can we go back one? Sorry, thank you. Uh, I was involved in the Corticus trial, and you can see great result in terms of outcome. Didn't make any difference. Martin Osukowski, he's Polish, but he's now in Vienna, but he did this very nice work in Dan Remick's lab in Michigan. And it was a mouse sequel ligation and puncture model, and he took blood six hours after giving them fecal peritonitis, fecal ligation and puncture. And these are sort of markers of pro-inflammatory status. And again, just pick on interleukin-6. A clear difference, this is a, like a seven-day model, a clear difference as early as six hours in the animals that would go on to live and die. These are, again, similar animals, age, gender, etc. He also looked at anti-inflammatory markers, and again, interleukin-10, clear separation between those animals that would eventually live and those animals that would eventually die. So in another study, he gave them steroids. And he began the steroids, dexamethasone, at eight hours and at 32 hours after sequel ligation and puncture. But he prognosticated, he separated them based on their interleukin-6 levels at six hours. And you can see. The overall Kaplan-Meier curve didn't make any difference. Steroids don't work. However, when you split them according to the prognostication, the animals predicted to die did significantly better if they got steroids. The animals predicted to live trended. It wasn't significant, but it was nearly so tended to do worse with steroids. Put them together, there was no difference. But you can see here, according to the prognostication, the patients, the animal patients, responded differently to steroids. If you go back to the Corticus study, no difference. But again, we did a sort of post hoc analysis. Well, this was a priori defined. Yep, the incidence of new infections, new sepsis was greater if you got steroids. Mm, that's a bad thing. There was a 37% increased risk. However, when you looked at the very sick end of the population, who were still on lots of vasopressors, low blood pressures at day one, their mortality rate was 56% in the placebo group, and it dropped down to 45% in the hydrocortisone-treated group. So perhaps if we pick the right patient, there may be an outcome benefit. The Australians have just finished 3,800 patients in the adrenal trial, 
I fear I know what the overall outcome is going to be, but I'd love to see if the sicker ones actually did better. What about beta blockers? Any beta blocker fans in the audience? No, a couple of hands going up. And me, I love beta blockers. I think they're wonderful. In the right patient at the right time. Um, this, uh, again, there's been an animal literature on this for a number of years, and some human studies, sort of case control observational studies. But Andrew Morelli did this trial, and I assisted from afar. This is in a university hospital in Rome. And they found that they took a population of septic shock patients, but not mild septic shock. These were ill patients. These were patients who, after 24 hours, were still on a lot of noradrenaline, norepinephrine, on average 0.4 mics per kilo per minute, and they were tachycardic, so these are risk factors. So you're looking at a subset of septic shock who are much higher risk than a lot of these patients who they're on some noradrenaline 24 hours later, it's off or virtually off. So you had a very sick subset. The control group mortality was high, very high, 80%, and it was halved in those randomized to receive esmolol titrating to their heart rate of between 80 and 95. But apart from the survival benefit, there was an improvement in cardiac function. They came off their norepinephrine quicker. The troponin I mentioned before, that's a risk factor for death. That came down more quickly. And the kidney function recovered more quickly. Hmm, maybe it's quite useful. OK, I said I'd uh, show you some of my own lab data. This is some recent stuff we've hopefully, uh, well, we've submitted it for publication. Again, we've got this, I think, nice, well-characterized, fluid-resuscitated rat model of fecal peritonitis. So basically, they're catheterized. They get arterial lines, central lines, tunneled. They can run around in their cage being monitored. We can give them fluid, take blood samples. And they get an intraperitoneal fecal slurry injection to cause peritonitis. Two hours later, oh, sorry, can you go back? Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Two hours later, we begin fluid, and they need a lot of fluid. At six hours, we do an echo to prognosticate. I'll come on to that later. And then we can either follow them through to if they live or die or sacrifice them at different time points. Six hours early on, 24 hours at their nadir, if they get through this period by 72 hours, if they've survived that long, they're actually clinically improving. They're now much more interested in their environment. They're eating, drinking, running around their cage. They look better. So we have a, an interesting model where the ones who are going to die have died, on average, between about 18 and 36 hours. On the other hand, the ones that are going to survive have actually started improving and look better. It's not just a case of they die later on. This is just a summary. So you can titrate the amount of slurry. So here, for this study I'll show you, we've titrated it to give about a 40 50% three-day mortality. But if they do die, it's between 18 and 36 hours. And I'd remind you, these are all the same species, often the same litter, all boys, all the same weight, all the same age. So there's nothing to choose between them. They look the same, the same genotype. Yet they behave differently. Half go on to live, half go on to die. And it struck me, and this is something I've been interested in a few years, why, if they're identical, they, they're not old, they haven't got comorbidities, why do some live and some die? I mentioned that the uh, survivors carry on improving. At the time we do this echo at six hours, they're mild. They're, we have a severity scale in terms of clinical severity. They're pretty mild. But we can pick them up with a whole battery of stuff. I'll show you a bit of data, but a whole battery of things. Initially, we showed it with echo. So a high heart rate separates the animals, a low stroke volume, despite them having lots of fluid. And now we've got about 48 other parameters. At six hours, you can identify the ones who are going to do badly. This is just an example of some of the data. So control group, not septic, the survivors, 
eventual survivors shown in yellow, non-survivors in red, you can see the heart rate goes up more so in the animals that go on to die. The stroke volume drops more so in the animals that do badly. Troponin, six hours, way higher in the animals that do badly. BNP, a little bit higher, way higher in the animals that do badly. So we're picking up these very early changes. We've done sort of parallel studies in our patients. We've taken sequential bloods in septic shock patients for every day for the first four days of their intensive care stay. And you can see the same things. So our rats actually reflect our patients, or perhaps the other way around. The heart rate's much higher, so the shaded bars are normal ranges. We have a higher heart rate in those that eventually die, patients. These are all pneumonia or peritonitis patients. Stroke volume is lower in the, animal, in the, animal, the human animals that go on to die. Troponin, a little bit higher in the eventual survivors, way higher in the non-survivors. The same with BMP. Hmm, so rats and humans, we're the same, comforting thought. The rats are really nice, really nice sort of white, hat, friendly rats. OK, so we have this model we can prognosticate. Can we do anything about it? Well, then at six hours, what we did, a further experiment, we randomized the survivors to either get Esmolol, short-acting beta blocker, or placebo, the non-survivors the same, and we continued it for 18 hours, and we'd done some pilot studies to try and work out a fixed dose that suited the animals and wasn't too much. So they had 18 hours of treatment, and Davide and Vic are the people who did all the hard work, and the Kaplan-Meier curve, there's the placebo mortality, about 50%, and the Esmol, the same. We delayed the time of death, but it made no difference. However, when we prognosticated early on the predicted non-survivors, we were pretty good at predicting that. Got it 90% right. There was a 10% survival. Whereas the survivors, we halved, you know, so down to 50% mortality. Significant improvement. So by definition, we helped the non-survivors, but the predicted survivors, we were pretty good at prognosticating. 85% survived. The predicted survivors did worse with the beta blocker, down to about 50% survival. Same animals, same age, same genotype, blah, blah, blah. Big difference in outcomes. Is it relevant to human beings? Well, maybe. Uh, this uh, paper came out from Carolyn Calfee on ARDS, and they call it subphenotype. So there's some sort of heavy statistics where they looked at a variety of trials that had been done by the ARDSnet group, and they found there were two main groups of phenotypes. There was this hyperinflammatory subphenotype. So these patients had higher plasma concentrations of inflammatory biomarkers, IL-1, IL-6, whatever. They needed more vasopressors. They were more likely to be septic. Lower bicarb, they were more acidotic, et cetera. These patients had a higher mortality and more time on a ventilator, more time with organ failure than those with the less severe or the less inflamed phenotype. And again, you've got this very interesting difference between the phenotype 1 and the phenotype 2 with a load of biochemical and physiological markers. So you had two different groups of patients. And what they showed was, again, the, there were differences, especially in vasopressor use and sepsis between the two groups, the more inflamed ones. So it's odds as a syndrome, but you can see the ones with sepsis were generally behaving in a different way in terms of their inflammatory phenotype compared to other groups. Oopsie daisy. And what did they show? Well, they looked at these two studies, and they showed there was this big mortality difference. So the mortality was between 23% and 44%, and another group, 19 and 51, depending on the phenotype. But they found in one of these studies where they'd uh, changed the PEEP strategy, so I'll find my pointer, 
low PEEP and high PEEP in phenotype 1, there was a 50% increase in mortality. It was slightly the other way round in the phenotype 2, the less inflamed. So again, it's a retrospective analysis, but you have a different response to PEEP in the patients with the less inflamed phenotype. So again, perhaps the way we manage our patient, twiddling the ventilator, depends on that biological characterization of the patient. Ards one size doesn't fit all. Perhaps it's exactly the same with sepsis. Uh, this came from um, Charles Hines and Julian Knight. This is a, a UK-based study looking at patients with peritonitis pneumonia, and they were looking at the sort of genomic landscape. But again, there were these two different phenotypes, or endotypes, they call them, where again, two different studies, the mortalities were different, and again, they were different in terms of their bicarbonate, platelets, vasopressors, blood pressure, etc., and the mortalities were very different. So perhaps we can pick the patients, whether it's this general signal or a specific biomarker signal, but I think we could be much more targeted than we are at present. So in summary, septic patients and animal models suggest the outcome is determined at an early stage of their critical illness. Does this mean we're merely delaying death in those determined to die with the way we're currently managing the patient? So we need to do something different. We know they're going to die from the time they're admitted. Clearly, it's logical to think, well, we're not helping them with what we're currently doing. We're just prolonging the inevitable. We need something more original. So the challenge is to use this knowledge appropriately to do something different which will hopefully be more effective in those very likely to die. And I think improving trial design would be a very useful way of starting, because we need to characterize and prove that this strategy actually works. I'll finish there. Thank you very much uh, indeed for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Mervyn, for a fantastic talk. Um, really, really nice. Now, do we have any questions from the floor? Oh, we've got David Ernst here. Uh, David Ernst from Melbourne, Australia. Enjoyed your talk. Just, uh, I guess, the, the last point that you made at the very end there, which is, it kind of makes me worry a little bit, which is, I appreciate the identifying who's going to live and who's going to die, but then you develop self-fulfilling prophecies, mm. which is, you run the risk of saying, I know this person's going to do poorly, and that's the beauty of what we do, is that there's always the twists and turns and surprises, mm. and we should never, I guess, get complacent that we know it all, because mm. there's always going to be a better way. Yeah, I completely agree. I'm, there was a, a famous British intensivist years ago called Dennis Edwards, who was one of the founding fathers of British intensive care, and he used to boast his mortality from pancreatitis was zero, because he never admitted them. <laughs> And I've heard the same with hemonc patients. And I, I agree with you. However, it's by the same time, if you were running a company and uh, 20, 30% of what you're making on your production line are faulty goods, you wouldn't carry on just making them and sell them and oh, then the customers complain they're faulty. You try and do something about it to try and stop 20 to 30% becoming faulty. So I agree with you. We, it absolutely mustn't be self-fulfilling, but at the same time, we mustn't kid ourselves that, oh, we're trying the very best for them. We are trying the best for them, but perhaps what we're doing is, is not that effective. And that, that's what worries me, that you know, we, it's blind faith rather than hopefully a bit of science. That's a good, good answer. I think we've got one more question here. Hi, Dr. Singer, Charlotte here. Um, my question is that you know, over the last two or three decades in sepsis one. We've had um, myriad studies on the phenotype and cohort on sepsis. Mm -hmm. Do you think the time has come to fund and really focus on genetic studies and precision medicine, as we call it, yeah. and look at markers which perhaps with CRISPR technology or uh, you know, the innovation that's going on in genomic yeah. medicine, uh, try and change the genetic makeup, which you, as you said, we're predicting patients very early on. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. I think, personally, genomics I'm not so interested in. I think it's far more interesting downstream. I think we're learning, and even if you talk to the genetic people, it was going to be the big new revolution. And now people have realized there's a hell of a lot of DNA. We don't know what they actually do. Micrornas are now increasingly important. Epigenetics important. And host environmental factors, comorbidities, medications. So I don't think, and all of the studies trying to pick out a genetic signal have, like the Genim study I showed, have failed miserably to actually clearly identify. Well, some people report, oh, this polymorphism shows you know, an increased mortality. Another group repeat it. It shows the opposite in a different population. So I, I think absolutely 100 agree with you, yes, but I'm not sure genetics is the answer. I think whether it's transcriptomic, metabolomic, proteomic, or some marker, a protein marker, you know, or a panel, but I think we can select them out. I, I was mentioning earlier, we've got all of these different things, whether we look at a few, a panel, you know, cholesterol. I've got an interest at the moment in cholesterol. It plummets when you're critically ill really early on in those that go on to die. In yeah. my rats, too. So again, okay. what's it telling us? Is it just a biomarker or is it actually biologically important? So I, I think at the moment, and that's the trouble, but, um, intensive care, unfortunately, we're all caught up with syndromes. Sepsis, ARDS, AKI. But we forget that there, there are different drivers and just because they have this clinical syndrome, the biological phenotype is hugely different. And the ones that go on to die, it tends to be more extreme, either things going up or things going down. So I think if we can actually be a lot more savvy about, OK, this particular group, and we've tried a particular therapy for that group, and look, it does make a difference, I think we'll move on. So yes, there will be the signals whether it's, you know, IL-6 for steroids or whatever, you know, troponin for beta blockers, don't know. Yeah, that's a great answer, Mervyn. I think we'll take one more question. Toby, Toby Thomas from Australia. Oh. You've sort of answered my, my <coughs> question in relation to uh, um, the role of genomics in the difference between the IL-10 levels or IL-6 levels in your rat model, mm. but if it's not the genetic makeup that gives this big difference, what do you think it is? I think probably uh, in the way we've grown up, you know, again, the rats are all the same, even from the same litter, so their genotype are identical, but whether or not some have been bitten more by, you know, when they were growing up, or bruised their knees and developed a different immune response, or the way they respond to things, a lot of, again, when you look now, intensive care essentially, by and large, is an increasingly geriatric specialty and not just the people that do it. But, you know, <laughs> the average age in the UK, don't know about your countries, but it's about 70 now. And these patients all have comorbidities. They're all on multiple medications, which will all affect their immune response, inflammatory response, cardiac response, etc., etc. So I, I think we've, the patients we're treating have now transcended beyond just their pure genetic profile, and nature has shaped them, and they're... Uh, their growth or their uh, lifespan has shaped them. So that, that's why I'm slightly steering away, well, more than slightly, I am steering away just from the pure genetics. We, we are just a little bit over time, but Mervyn, could you just tell me, if you were going to design a new trial mm -hmm. with sepsis, what would be your, your prognostic markers that you'd use early? Depends on the therapy. It. Sure. You know, the, the posh word is theranostic. So in other words, you, you find the biomarker that suits the treatment, and you can show, hopefully in a good animal model or pilot studies, that that can be used, and you titrate your therapy appropriately. Right. You know, because, for example, I think steroids are good, but one size fits all is idiotic when you think about it, because we know patients have a markedly different inflammatory response, so why should we perhaps poison some people with too much and underdose people with too little? I would argue we're doing exactly the same with antibiotics at the moment. Sure. We haven't got a clue what we're doing. So we're over-treating some, under-treating others. So I think we need to be far smarter. I think the problem is, uh, well, it's just a fact of life, but pharmaceuticals evolve at a faster rate than diagnostics. Sure. And sure. now we're playing catch-up. And pragmatics versus... And pragmatics, yeah. exactly. I think we're in, uh, my final comment there, we're, I think we're a little bit enthralled to the great god P.
So we've got to enroll so many patients to try and show a significant difference. And I think, personally, that's the wrong way of going about it. Refinement. Totally. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much so indeed.